one in there. Who? Yeah. Don't see it, weirdly enough. I've got uh, it on Linux, so I'm sure uh, everyone ah, yeah. else okay. has got it. Okay, now I see it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if I've got it on Linux, everyone must have it. Uh, same, I'm on Linux. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to help me to navigate. Yeah, it's also in tiny font, everything on Linux for no obvious reason. Uh, also for the attendees, so uh, we are still doing what we are, were doing before. We just switched from YouTube to Zoom. So uh, if you could uh, keep the chat in Discord, that would be much better because it will persist. Uh, and don't use the chat in the Zoom. Uh, that would like, yeah, that's not as good as the Discord. So if you can keep the chat at Discord, that would be great. And I do believe the speaker look at Discord as well. So. Can I check where is it announced in Discord that we're in this uh, Zoom chat now? Yes, I believe there was an announcement on the was conference. It in the, announcement oh, in the announcements. Oh, gotcha. Yep. Yeah. I see it. Good. Yeah. Oh, YouTube, yeah. YouTube. I have disabled the Zoom chat already, so people uh, don't try to use it. <laughs> How do you do that? Right. I think uh, are all the speakers in. If you like, okay. Uh, if you come in late, it's still fine. Yes. Uh, uh, Alicia, do you have anything special? Like you raise your hand. I would just lower ah, it. No, no, no. I don't just, think you're, uh, you're yeah. just testing, right? Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Anybody have have some YouTube joke? Well, we just had one, a big one today. YouTube is a joke itself, uh, in my opinion. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I already said it on Twitter, so I'm allowed to say it here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, so if, if everybody's ready, uh, I think we'll just start. And uh, this is recorded, by the way, so I think uh, we would have it um, afterwards. So, Sarah, about all this interruption, uh, and I think Jeremy is happy to give his talk starting from beginning. And we'll try to condense everything. So uh, if speaker finish early and we can, if we can switch very smoothly, then we just go ahead and... Um, and try to get the break back as soon as possible. Otherwise, we will lost 30 minutes in the break, which is fine. I think you have enough time for pizza. So um, yeah, Jeremy, if, if you're ready. Yeah, sure. Yeah. OK, I need to have a uh, screen sharing enabled. Cherry, do you need our speakers to mute and turn our video off? I'm guessing you do. Uh, mute and... No, I think if Jeremy shared the screen, then we won't be able to see our face. So, Jeremy, can you share the screen? Uh, no, I can't. It's um, host is a participant to share the screen sharing. Uh, you're a panelist, though. Um, uh, Nicola, do you have any idea why this is happening? Um, it may be oh, that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Region. There's a setting uh, there. I see. Okay, now you can do it. Someone else is. Yeah. Yep. Now, like, uh, yeah, I let all the panelists. Okay, fine. Right. Okay, so when you're ready. <laughs> yeah, let's start again. <laughs> yeah. So you know my name, uh, you know, yeah, everything. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, so let's do some, uh, some stuff and hopefully, uh, yeah, it will hold. So I'm going to start over. Uh, we are looking at, uh, at uh, Jupyter Lab. It's uh, next gen UI for Project Jupyter. Current version is 2.1. Uh, it's basically just a set of extensions and all of these extensions, they have an interface and they have comments. And the application also has something called a shell. It's like uh, defining several areas. Uh, for example, this main area, uh, the left area where you can actually look at the files, uh, the top area with the, the menu uh, and the bottom and the uh, right area as well. So all of this is usually actually implemented in TypeScript or JavaScript and everything is packaged through NPM. So it's not really like tools like the Python developers are used to. So the question is like, um, how could we actually try to, you know, get access to all of these th things, but uh, from Python instead. So there is another thing in, uh, in Jupyter, it's called the Jupyter widgets. And uh, with the widgets, you can create uh, objects on in, uh, in Python on the kernel side. Here I'm creating a slider, you can modify the value and uh, what happens is that actually on the browser, there is uh, another widget is created, but that's basically what we're seeing right now. 
and um, we can define several views for the same widget. And if we modify the value, it's in sync. We can get the value from the, the Python kernel. So the idea would be to somehow abuse this kind of framework or kind of take advantage of this uh, uh, message uh, sending over web sockets to be able to control a bit more than just widgets. So in our case, we'd like to control uh, the actual ID, uh, the actual lab. So let's look at uh, this thing called IPyLab. So this diagram is pretty much the same as we want, the one we saw before, except that here we see that once we are in the browser, we can proxy things to actually execute commands in lab or add widgets to uh, different areas than the notebook. And the idea is that you can actually prototype uh, simple we uh, web applications like this from a notebook and uh, also get an idea of what the JupyterLab API looks like uh, in case you want to create a real extension later. So to be able to use this, uh, can install it on uh, via Conda or via pip. And they also need uh, this lab extension. So let's look at the uh, first example. Uh, you, pro you already saw it maybe, I'm not sure. But uh, the idea is like uh, with the widgets, you can create buttons, you can create a progress bar, uh, can also create images and we can connect them together. So here we define a callback on the button. And when the button is clicked, it's going to execute this code here. Uh, now we're going to add this uh, button and a progress bar to the top area. So we can scroll the notebook and it stays there. And we can actually click on the button. There's a long computation is happening. And when the pizza is ready, happen, it shows up on the right side. And when we are done, uh, we can keep the, the button at the top or we can close it to make some space. Now I'm going to go over a few other things so that we get access to the commands. There are at the moment 252 commands, but there could be more or less, depends on the extensions you have installed. Uh, one of the commands is about creating a console. So it's pretty much the same as um, a regular console. So if you go to file and uh, click on the new and console, you get the same thing. You can also change the theme programmatically, you can bring it back to light and create a terminal. Uh, what else? Yeah, so now that we are in a Python land, uh, we can create some, uh, some charts, let's say with a BQ plot, we can generate some random data. And here we're executing this function. So every time we execute it, it's going to uh, create random data. But what we do now is we're going to actually create a comment on a Jupyter Lab. And whenever we execute it, it's going to also call this function here. So you get a list of comments if you go to the comment palette right here. But if we search for comment, uh, we see that, okay, actually it was already there. So if you want to add, add it to the, the palette, uh, you can just do this. And uh, yeah, so now you can actually trigger it from here and it's going to call this, uh, this function here that generates new data. So uh, let's look at uh, the next thing. So widgets, we can create all types of widgets. For example, a split panel have a progress bar with a slider, you can set the title, you can change the orientation, bring it back to vertical, uh, add uh, the same widget one more time. And uh, we can also add a play widget if we want to. So all of this is cool. Um, you can move this thing here. But now let's look at how we would add that to the left and right area. So you can do a shell.add. Uh, to the left, and now it shows up here. Uh, it's pretty much the same widget still. Now we can add it to the right area as well. And uh, uh, there is a zoom over it, but now it's gone. Yeah, so we can pretty much keep that around uh, whenever we want to have access to, to it and continue with uh, our notebook. So let's look at the next and the last example. So all of this was more like of a demo of what you can do, but concretely you can actually build some things that can be useful. <laughs> so like, let's say you, you want to recreate this, uh, this file browser. So here, if we go inside the folder, you don't see the other folders, but 
instead what we could do is we can create our own. So this is pretty much like going through all of the files uh, on a disk, creating a tree. Uh, this is what it looks like in memory. Um, now we're going to make a widget out of this with a widget called ipytree. So it's a bit uh, nicer, you can expand and collapse. And uh, now we can add it to the left. So first we're going to define a couple of buttons, we're going to call, define the callbacks on the buttons. So we are able to open the files in, uh, in lab. And now we're going to add it to the left. So it shows up like, like, uh, like before, right here. So we have it on the left side. And we can scroll back here and we see that everything is in sync uh, because of the way widgets work. We can expand the tree if we want, we can collapse it, um, and we can select multiple files if we want to, and then click on open, and they're going to open uh, right in the main area. Okay, so we can have it on the right side as well if we want. And yeah, I guess this is particularly useful or not. Uh, up to you, but uh, yeah, this is kind of, uh, this is basically the way you could create this uh, in Python, uh, right in lab. All right, so use cases, uh, one more time, uh, mostly about exploring the, uh, the lab API from Python, prototype uh, small extensions, and uh, also, I mean, maybe we'll just like to hack their stuff, their tools, so this is pretty much the one way to do it. Uh, if you want to try it, uh, there is a binder link on the IPy lab repo. And uh, if you want to go uh, a bit further than that, uh, you should check out Voila to create uh, standalone web applications from Jupyter Notebooks. And you should also check out the uh, Accession Developer Guide to create uh, Jupyter Lab extensions. And there is a repo with a, a lot of examples. All right, uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy. I think uh, if yeah, people want to chat with uh, Jeremy, you can find him in the Discord chat. And next we have uh, Lauren up. And Lauren, are, we, are you ready? Hello? Uh, yes. Right. We can see your slide perfectly. And uh, have okay. you can, mute? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. You're yeah, good to go. So you can start when um, you're ready. Wait, let me. And can you see me too? Yeah. Great, so I launched the countdown okay. and let's, let's get started. Uh, oh, I don't see, I don't see my slides. Uh, is it, is it normal? Uh, we can see your slides. Okay, okay, perfect. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for having me today. So my goal is to show that you can build uh, magical solutions. Uh, wait a moment, okay. Um, I love this quote from, from Clark. Um, every time I've seen um, machine learning, I felt magic. And, and my goal is to show you that you can build something magical, uh, even without any expertise uh, in machine learning. If you are spending a lot of time already on machine learning, you have developed expertise and you are most likely dealing with uh, neural networks. But if you spend most of your time developing something else, then you can still uh, benefit from machine learning by using, for instance, APIs. So these machine learning APIs are models that are ready to use. Uh, and they are pretty generic models, but also filling a very big gap for two years, there are also AutoML techniques. And AutoML techniques allow you to build your own custom models, uh, fit, uh, fitting your own needs. And my goal in the next minutes is to to give you a, a quick look of these uh, building blocks. Okay, so first the APIs and uh, a vision model. So the input of course is, um, is pictures. And if I give this picture to the vision model, it will describe it to me with labels. This picture is about nature and flowers and everything. It's also able to detect landmarks. So for instance here, it's able to tell me that this picture comes from New Zealand and more Precisely where the Lord of the Rings movie is uh, were shot. Uh, still, more precisely, it's able to detect objects in a picture. Um, so here, it's able to tell me that there are persons and even pens here. 
more precisely, uh, it can detect faces and face features and even face emotions. So here, for instance, it tells me that Gollum is angry and uh, Gollum is always angry. Uh, another problem, OCR. Uh, OCR now is a solved problem thanks to machine learning. Uh, so this is a screenshot and the vision model is able to perfectly transcribe the text. Um, even if I trans, uh, transform the picture with some perspective effect, it's, it will still perfectly detect all, all the different sentences, words, and even symbols. So this is a solved problem. But it also works on something a lot more difficult, that's handwriting. So it's able to, to transform handwriting into text. So here, it's, not, it's a, a lot more difficult problem. So for instance, it works on, on, on this block of text. It just makes two mistakes, right? One here and one here. But even doctors sometimes can't read back what, what they've written, right? Uh, so, and finally, with a, a vision model is also able to detect entities, uh, famous entities uh, in a picture. So on this one, it tells me that most likely this picture comes, is unique and comes from a Spanish newspaper and most likely is about Tolkien, which is perfectly correct. So we've seen what you can do on pictures. You can actually do that with a few lines. Uh, they are open source client libraries wrapping the APIs. And you can do that with a few lines of Python. Uh, it's always the same principle. You create a client, you provide the input. So here a picture, you call the feature you are interested in, face detection, and you can use the results right away in a few lines. So that's really powerful. You can extrapolate what, what you've seen on pictures to videos. Uh, videos are pictures with one more dimension time. And so I've written this uh, tutorial if you're uh, interested in videos. And actually with these few lines, I could uh, detect this uh, baby insect and even track it on the video. Okay, so it's all online. You will, uh, you will get uh, everything and the slides at the end. So we've seen everything uh, on um, pictures and videos, but it also works uh, on text and natural language processing if you've seen the previous talk about uh, spacing. So you can prove, uh, once again, uh, natural language processing uh, uh, is a problem that's mainly solved thanks to machine learning today. If you provide text to a natural language model, it will tell you that uh, it's in English, for instance, uh, it will give you the precise syntax, uh, the exact sentence uh, of, of your uh, text block. Uh, it's also able to detect uh, entities. So here, for instance, I have three groups of entities, persons in red, Tolkien is detected as a person. By the way, this identifier is exactly the same as Tolkien previously uh, in the picture. Uh, British is related to the UK, the United Kingdom, and the books are detected, detected as works of art. Uh, that's, so that's perfect. Uh, you can ask for classification. This uh, text should be classified under books and literature at 97% uh, of confidence, and that's again perfect. And like emotions uh, in the pictures before, you can uh, get a, a sense of uh, the sentiment uh, in, in the text. Uh, are we talking positively or negatively about uh, persons, entities, or mainly uh, as a whole in the text? So here, those are two book reviews. Uh, and what I get are uh, scores between minus one and plus one, uh, knowing whether uh, uh, it's being talked about uh, uh, this positively or negatively. I just need uh, these few lines uh, to analyze the sentiments in, in, in a text and, and export the results immediately, okay? Next one on text is translations. Um, translating text uh, is again, uh, you can reach very good results thanks to machine learning. Uh, it used to be statistical model in the past. Here uh, in my sample code, I have more uh, comments uh, than useful code. So here you create a client and you call translate and it works on text and HTML. And finally, uh, you can do that uh, on uh, speech. So you can transcribe, transcribe speech into text. Uh, and so it means you can also get the exact location of each word in, in your speech stream. Those are the few lines. Uh, it's again a tutorial I've written online if you're interested. And the opposite, you can uh, provide text and get very human-like uh, speech out of it. Uh, again, thanks to machine learning. In one second, you can generate 20 seconds of speech. Here is an example uh, where you just create a client, you call synthesized speech, and thanks to that, you can create uh, speech with the Australian, British, or even Indian English. 
of course, American is supported too, and French and so on. Okay, so you've seen what you can do with existing models, generic ones. But if that doesn't fill your needs, and here is an example, these two pictures, uh, I get the same results with a vision model because basically those are clouds in the sky. But what if I want to have something more specific, like doing weather forecasting and knowing which type of cloud it is? Then for that, I just need uh, a data set. So this is the work I need to do. Uh, you, can, you need to provide your own uh, pictures in this case, and you need to label them. And then you, you just launch, it's fully automated, you launch a training and you know the results and you can use the API right away. It's your own private API, you can use it. And if you have done an edge training, you can even export it to get it to run offline somewhere else. It works on text, pictures and videos and also structured data and you can build all for the time being these custom uh, features. So I've, I've, I've made a demo to, to try and see uh, how it works. Uh, let's, so let's try to do it live with you, okay? Uh, I invite you to take your uh, smartphone and get connected uh, with this QR code, or you can also type bit.ly slash mlpythonpizza, okay? Uh, I will do it. We are running out of time. And so this is, this is uh, my other camera. I have uh, made a model uh, without any expertise and it's able to detect whether people are sticking their tongue out. Okay. So the, the selfie is uploaded in the cloud, analyze whether is there a face or not. And, and I have the results here. Okay, it's, it has detected that I have a tongue out and also I have a, a new mustache between my tongue, uh, and my mouth and my nose. Let's see if we have other people. Oh, yeah, yeah, it works. Thank you for participating. People with the tongue out. And here, I'm also able to, of course, to detect whether there are people with glasses. So you see, people yawning. Yeah, yeah, it works. So you see, it, it doesn't only work with my own stream, but also with, uh, uh, with new pictures the models has never seen. So time to wrap up. There are many, many uh, uh, more slides uh, on the presentation online. Uh, what have we seen? So uh, if you need to do something quick and if the models are fit your needs, in a couple of hours, you can actually uh, build smarter solutions with existing APIs. If it doesn't fit your needs, maybe you can build a custom model with AutoML techniques. Most cloud providers uh, have this kind of solution and some uh, are dedicated dedicated companies, okay? And of course you can invest more time uh, if uh, you want to become an expert. My slides are here. I will put them uh, in the Discord chat. Uh, thanks a lot for having me and ideally I hope it gave you a few ideas. I will stick around uh, on the chat if you have questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, again, if you have any questions, you can, you know, obviously find Orange in Discord. Um, so uh, we have a changes in the schedule. So uh, up next, we will have Alista instead of uh, Arthur. Uh, we will move Arthur's talk at the end of this block, which is after uh, Adrian. So um, uh, Lisa, if you are ready. Then, yep. Yep. So yeah, you can just start whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. Oh. Give me a second. Then. So you should be able to see the presentation now, right? Yes, we can see the slice. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna keep it short so that we can catch up on our pizza and other important talks. I wanted to talk about non-technical issue because even before the pandemic, um, the mental health issue is and was a little bit fuzzy. And not every country, not every city, and not every company had a proper policy how to approach that. So who am I? I'm a machine learning engineer tree now. I'm Python and Rust enthusiast, and I'm trying to incorporate those tools in my everyday life. And since a couple of years, I'm a psychology and empathy enthusiast. So the big problem with a mental health issue is it's a new area, let's say, or rather a uh, fresh area, and it didn't have um, all the tooling set up or doesn't have yet all the definitions or most of the definitions, what are symptoms, what are um, sicknesses, illnesses, conditions are rather fuzzy and they are ch tends to change. 
Another thing is a lot of symptoms are very subjective. For instance, I'm sick or I feel um, very tired. Is it tired for long enough? Do I have headaches because I'm tired or is it something else? And also there is so less data on researchers that you can't even identify the thresholds that uh, will support the fuzzy definitions. I wanted to talk about my personal experience in burnout and depression. So let's get started with burnout. Um, originally and officially burnout is work-related stress, chronic stress that results in energy depletion in very bad mental state or very bad place. The feelings of um, cynicism and negativity about yourself, your achievements, especially about your work and overall uh, emotional isolation and withdrawal. The general advice how to improve your situation would be go on vacation, take a time off your job, try to reevaluate how you approach your um, work goals. Um, a lot of people who are overachievers or perfectionists tend to have burnouts rather frequently. Try to socialize more then engage in a hobby and preferably make it quite far from your work so that you won't associate your work with your hobby and thus already put some negative uh, connotation onto it. Try relaxation, meditation and yoga. Find a psychologist is obviously always a good idea and try to incorporate healthier habits in your lifestyle. Um, but the problem is nowadays with the pandemic in place and the lockdown, it is easier said than done. There is a current in addition that helps me to get through this. And this is, first of all, reduce the incoming messages and news from the internet. We have a lot of negative information stream consuming on everyday basis. And you really sometimes just better shut down the internet and read a book. What helps me the most is actually giving completely random props to my colleagues, sending them stupid jokes like the ones you've heard about Chuck Norris and uh, programming today from our hosts. I found them hilarious. Try to surprise people. Try to talk to people that you weren't really friendly with, just a little small talk, a little props. Give your social connections more meaning. This is an interesting one. You talk a lot, you all probably talk a lot with uh, other people on Slack or on Facebook or like all the streaming platforms nowadays, but just talking is not enough in current situation. You better put some progress into it. For instance, play a game or try to write a book together. Make the connections uh, progress through the time. And also, funny enough, you need privacy. If you are not alone in your home, then make sure that your family gives you physical and emotional privacy. Depression is a very different beast and very dangerous one. I'm not giving any um, advices on clinical depression, but something that can help you to cope with your current state. So it's a chemical imbalance with genetic components, quite strong environmental and psychological factors that show itself in low mood or mood swings over several weeks low energy, inadequate self-portrait, or really low self-worth, uh, poor concentration, and decrease to no motivation. I think everybody had the feeling that they have at least one of the symptoms at some point in their life. The general advice is kind of very straightforward. You better find a therapy. Um, you should talk to your doctor about taking some medicaments. Um, try to incorporate healthier lifestyle choices and try some gratitude exercises or so-called psy uh, positive psychology attitude and socialize more. However, again, socializing is right now a little bit different, to say the least, and sometimes not always possible in the form and the way that you need it. However, quarantine, when you feel a little bit depressed or actually when you really feel depressed, can be a good thing because you are in your safe zone. See? the lockdown as being completely safe where you are and see the situation as a very limited and restricted experiment. You have more factors that you have a control over. For instance, you don't have to commute. Um, you can go onto online, onto Slack, working uh, 
into different times when you need it. And people will be understandable. So try to observe what triggers you or what gives you some positive um, kicks. Learn a secret skill. Some people have so low motivation that nothing can kick them to start learning things or start doing things. Try to see it as an opportunity to learn something completely secret in, again, a safe zone and then show it off the moment you want to shine the most. Also try to incorporate different routines. Try to brew a coffee every day at eight. Try to read a book before you go to sleep. Try to count the pigeons outside of your window. Something that is preferably healthy and something that you can stick to. Your brain needs routine and doesn't matter how small or how funny it can be, it will help. So there are several links, I will post them later on in the Discord channel on progressive muscle meditation and relaxation, on mindful meditation. I don't think that I have to talk about it a lot. Then self-tracking tool is something that will help you to collect the data about yourself and do not jump into conclusions right away, but just see the trends. Then some more inspirations from Reddit, like what to track, how to track, how to interpret, and some more ideas. So stay frosty and stay healthy. Thank you. I hope I now have created more time for our next speaker and didn't uh, break all the plans. Thanks, Elisa. Nice talk. Yeah. Um, so next speaker is Ian. Hello, this is Ian. Hi. Uh, let me uh, find my slides. Oh, I need to screen share. Should be desktop two. I share that. I see this. So Ian is going to talk about flying pandas, dusk, modding, and bakes. And live from pandas. London. <laughs> yeah. Shoot. Thanks. Am I good to go? Yes. Okay. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Oswald, and I'm presenting from London, not Berlin, like many of uh, my fellow speakers. Uh, so uh, who am I? I'm an interim chief data scientist. Uh, this means I work with many teams in a consulting fashion in large companies and small companies. Uh, and I've been doing this for quite a long time, uh, over 19 years now. Um, back when it was called AI and not data science. Uh, along the way, I've co-founded uh, and helped build up the PyData London movement uh, here in uh, the UK, uh, which I'm super proud of. We've got over 11,000 members now, and some of you I know are members and past speakers uh, in our meetup. Um, and so between PyData and uh, my client work, I get to work on lots of interesting problems and encounter lots of interesting difficulties, uh, particularly around high performance computing. That's what uh, we'll be talking about today. Uh, I've also co-written O'Reilly's high performance Python book six years ago, uh, and we've just uh, finished after a year's work, the second edition that'll be out in the next month. Um, and I teach public courses, including on high performance, and I've got one coming up in uh, about six weeks. Um, look on my blog if you're interested. So today's goal, we'll look at uh, the Modin and Dask frameworks to give you more power with your pandas data processing and I'll give you a quick peek at Vakes. So when does uh, pandas uh, go a bit smelly? Well on my laptop with 32 gigs of RAM I typically process uh, millions of rows of data uh, depending on the number of uh, columns that I've got um, with tens of gigabytes of RAM and that works fine. I'm limited to 32 gigabytes of RAM, um, and I'm limited uh, to a couple of cores on this machine, but Pandas typically uses only one core, and it was only built for in-RAM computation. It's got no way to spool to disk. Uh, and also the Pandas code base is 10 years old. It's been uh, changed a few times. It's really hard to optimize it. Um, so we're gonna look at several tools. They've been designed to go beyond single machine and in-RAM computation limits and to work in multi-core ways, um, but they have different uh, requirements and different uh, offerings.
So Modin is the first we'll talk about. Uh, this is an, uh, an academic project. Um, interestingly, they defined an algebra for data frames, not just pandas, um, but the R data frame and others. They've uh, used this to create an optimization framework. Uh, practically, they've re-implemented the pandas interface. So we have a pandas-like tool uh, for the most common pandas functions. And for the ones that aren't uh, available, they fall back to pandas. So it should just be a drop-in replacement for pandas, as far as you're concerned. Uh, their innovation, if you look at the diagram on the right, is to go from just using columns uh, of data in pandas to block the data by rows and columns so that the Ray parallel computation engine can parallelize the workloads on multi-cores on a single machine or potentially uh, I think more than one machine. Uh, it's very easy to experiment with and uh, I'd encourage you to give it a go. So here's a simple experiment. Uh, at the top I've generated a pandas standard data frame with 500 million rows of data and three columns. That's about nine gigabytes worth of data. I then ask on column A the isNAR function. So is column A, uh, does it have any missing values? And that takes about 0.7 seconds to execute. I then pass this into Modin using PDMD, give it uh, my data frame, ask it for a Modin data frame. And then on DFMD, that's the Modin data frame, I ask the same question on column A with isNAR. And that takes 0.15 seconds, an easy four times speed up. Now that's brilliant, that uh, gives me a nice speed up for no work, but practically I found things work either the same speed or somewhat faster or quite a lot slower. So I've done some more digging. Uh, earlier in the year, the team released a really nice paper towards scalable data frame systems. Uh, and that includes this graph, uh, this set of four graphs. Here they're comparing Modin in yellow versus pandas in blue for increasing sized data sets, 50 to 250 gigabytes, uh, and a couple of different operations. Uh, and in each of them, Modin does really well. And I think the data set size is the interesting bit here. They're not talking about tens of gigabytes, they're talking about tens to hundreds of gigabytes worth of data in a single machine, bigger than my laptop for sure. Uh, this is a large Amazon machine. So I went on to their project on GitHub and uh, asked on issue 1390 for some advice about when to use Modin. And they've given some really thoughtful answers with a lot of links and a lot of guidance. So if you're curious about the use of Modin, I strongly recommend you go and have a look at issue 1390 uh, and see what they're offering by way of advice. It's a drop-in replacement, you just give it a go. Next up, we have Dask's distributed data frame. So Dask is a wider project. It's a very mature. Uh, it's older than Modin and older than uh, Vakes that I'll mention in a moment. Uh, and it covers more than uh, just pandas. So it has an array interface, which gives us a distributed NumPy-like uh, object for matrix and vector operations. And it has a bag, which gives us a Python list-like object. So we can do pure Python, NumPy, and pandas operations. The distributed data frame works by blocking up regular pandas data frames into sets which are based on row uh, sizes. So it's not row and column based uh, parallelization, it's row based parallelization. And each object is an actual pandas regular data frame behind the scenes. The syntax is pretty similar to regular pandas. So here on the left, I'm reading in some Parquet files into a DD, that's a DAS uh, data frame, to give me a distributed data frame, a DDF. Uh, on the right hand side, I take my DDF and I do a regular operation, a group by on column C and I take the mean. And then the change in syntax is I have to call compute. Uh, if I don't call compute, I don't get an answer. It's, uh, it uses a lazy computation framework. Behind the scenes, it builds up a task graph for execution. What I like about Dask is that it's really uh, mature and it has rich diagnostics. And when debugging parallel systems, you want good diagnostics. Here I can start up a client. I've asked for four processes, eight gigs of memory per process. Uh, inside Jupyter, I get a URL, I open the URL, and then bottom left, I get a worker's output and I can see my four processes, their memory usage, the limit, uh, the amount of CPU they're using. And on the bottom right, that's the task graph display. And there I can see all of the minor operations loading in those Parquet data files, which are being aggregated together and then further aggregated so that I build up towards my group by mean result. And I can see that operating in real time and I can get full logs behind it. 
Now, if you just load in a regular data frame that fits into RAM in Pandas, but you load it into Desk, you'll find that it runs slower, over 10 times slower. It turns out you can persist the data frames in memory to avoid the reading and writing overhead, which is the cause of the slowdown. Then it works at roughly the same speed as long as the data fits in RAM. That means you can prototype your workflow using Desk in RAM at the same speed as Pandas. And then when you're ready to switch to hundreds of gigabytes worth of data, you turn off the persisting and exactly the same workflow works. Uh, there's lots of documents uh, and help on Stack Overflow. And you can change that client configuration from one machine to multiple machines or a remote really big machine, a big Amazon machine perhaps. And it just works exactly the same. It just flows across. Um, the one top tip I will give you from my experiments is that you have to give your workers lots of RAM. Otherwise, very frequently, you will find out of memory errors, uh, even though you're using the default configuration from Dask. And that's typically driven by loading in partitions of data, the parquet data that I was reading in here uh, with uh, too many rows in there. So they're too large and they just need uh, really big workers to make them process. Vakes uh, is the third project. I've just got the one slide on this. It's a new project. It looks like pandas. It's actually an entirely new thing, a very different code base, uh, which happens to present with a pandas-like interface uh, offering a subset of pandas. Uh, it doesn't have 10 years of baggage. It's a new thing. Um, it uses memory mapping, so it can look at terabytes worth of data on your hard drive uh, and then pretend that it's all in RAM. They've got an interesting virtual column option. So you can say, make a column B, which is column A plus one on a billion rows. It won't calculate a billion operations. It'll only calculate the operations for the rows that you then touch later on. So it's all lazy computation based. They've also implemented a new string data type. The regular pandas one comes from Python. It's fast, but it's quite memory bloated. The one they've operated on uh, in Vakes is really RAM efficient. So if you're doing lots of NLP type work, it's brilliant. There's an excellent article on towards data science that I've linked here. I recommend you look at it. It's really compelling when you go and uh, read through what they're offering. So in summary, I think if you can do everything in pandas and you've got enough RAM, stick to pandas. That makes life easy uh, and gives you a very standard workflow. If your data is bigger than RAM, then Dask is very good for that. If your data fits into RAM, but you want some cutting edge optimizations, which might make it go faster, try Modin. It just works. Uh, and definitely try Vakes, particularly if you've got string operations, because you get that new string data type. On Monday, I'm giving a public talk at PyData Budapest uh, via Zoom, I believe. Um, and I'll be talking about smaller data frames and the optimizations there. I've got lots of tips on my blog. Uh, uh, look on there. And uh, there'll be notes from my classes as well, including my upcoming high performance class. Uh, and I've got an, uh, an ask for you, uh, audience. Uh, if I've taught you something, I love to receive postcards. I've got a wall of postcards cards from eight years of public speaking now. Uh, if you'd like to send me a postcard, please email me. I'll send you my address and you'll make me very happy by sending me a physical postcard from somewhere in the world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Yay, I have to remember to unmute myself now. Okay, so thank you, Ian. And next will be uh, Dana. Are you ready, Dana? Yes, just a moment. Yeah, here I am. Uh, I'm going to share the screen in a bit. Yep. Um, okay. Whoops, just a moment. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before I was saying, like, when I was uh, forgot to unmute myself, I was saying that Ian got a very nice background and a very nice shirt. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. So, Dana, are you ready? Yes, just a moment. Can you see the um, slides? We, we can't see the slides um, yet. A moment. Yes, OK, is it OK now? Now we can see it. And you sound perfect, so it's fine. OK, perfect. So I'll start. Uh, so thank you for joining my session. Uh, today, I will uh, talk about one of the services that the cloud provides, that serverless functions. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to get started and to deploy your Python application using them. So a bit about me. I'm uh, Dana. I'm based in Utrecht, uh, close to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And uh, here are my LinkedIn profile and my GitHub if you want to connect. I'll share the slides there and on Discord as well. So today I'm going to talk briefly about why you should be interested in cloud computing. Uh, then I'm going to briefly explain what serverless functions are. And finally, I will show you how you can create your own serverless application in Python. So let's start with why you should be interested in the cloud computing. So imagine that you have an idea for an awesome application. So if you never... Um, like deployed one, uh, you, like you, sh you, sh you should know at least that you should deploy it in order to reach your target audience and then 
deploying. If you've never done it before, it's quite complex. It has a lot of components there. You need servers, you need a dedicated network, you need application security, just to make sure that your application works correctly. So these are a lot of components, as you might uh, notice, and the initial setup might be expensive and risky uh, because you might end up, uh, well, doing uh, wrong capacity planning, buying way too many servers. And if your application doesn't have as many users as you expect, um, then you will have resources that are underutilized. It's uh, like the opposite scenario is you buy too few and you have a spike in the number of uh, users that use your application, and then you have to scale up quickly. So uh, this is where the cloud comes in uh, and tries to like uh, shift the pressure from capacity planning. So cloud computing is nothing else than like a platform that cloud providers provide in order for you to get access to computing resources and services over the internet. So cloud providers have a dedicated uh, network like of worldwide uh, data centers with a lot of computing power that you can use for your own application. So this means that instead of uh, worrying about servers provision, scaling and managing, you can just let the cloud provider to do it for you. This means that your application can scale very flexibly and then uh, you have built in availability and fault tolerance. So after we saw briefly why cloud computing is interesting, uh, let's talk about one of the services it provides and the serverless functions. I will focus on uh, one particular cloud provider that's Microsoft Azure and it's serverless uh, offering that's Azure Functions. So let's see what Azure Functions are. So Azure Functions is a serverless compute service that lets you run event-triggered code. So a lot of words here. Let's see what this means with uh, an example. So when you talk about serverless functions, you need to think in terms of events and triggers. And what events are, are nothing else than a way in which you tell your function that it needs to start running. So you have something like an HTTP trigger or like a database change or maybe uh, an upload of an image or a file in some blob storage. Uh, and this is an event that tells your function that it needs to start computing. And then you have bindings. And this is the way you integrate your uh, serverless function with other services in the cloud. So let's look at an example. Imagine that you upload an image uh, to blob storage. And then this will be a trigger for your serverless function, for example, to do one thing, like resize it. And then you can bind your function with other services like databases or maybe like machine learning services and use the like the output that your function provides. So it's important to remember that serverless functions need to be small, short, and like do usually one thing. Uh, so what are the benefits of this? Um, first of all, like if you don't have to care about the infrastructure about the way you're going to deploy it, you can spend more time on thinking about your code and developing your application. You only pay for the time your um, function is running so that's very like cost efficient and finally you don't have to worry if there are any spikes or sudden decreases in the number of uh, users your application has because the cloud provider will scale your application for you so once we have some basic idea of what serverless functions are let's see how we can create one in python so um, to get started you need three things you need uh, the command line uh, azure command line in order to connect to the cloud um, so the example I'm going to show here is uh, like it's based on my Mac, uh, but I will share a link in the end from a workshop where you can find examples for Windows and Linux operating systems. Um, okay, then uh, we need uh, the core tools. The core tools are a uh, thing we use to test and run our function locally. And this is how we can install it. And finally, you need an Azure account. You can create one for free if you go to the link and you will get around $200 of free credit to get started. Um, so when uh, we get uh, when we, the first thing we need to do when we are developing an Azure serverless project is to generate a project template. We can do it very easily by running this uh, command. And then if, if you can see, I'm uh, choosing the language I'm going to use. In my case, it's Python. So what this command will do for me is um, generate a project template. Uh, in my case, function Python HTTP example that contains three files. It contains the uh, uh, host JSON file that contains the global configuration options. <coughs> It contains the local settings file. And these are the settings that you use when you're running your application locally. And finally, we have a requirements file that's generated for us. Every Python developer knows uh, what this is. That's the place where all your requirements are stored. Um, after we created the functions template, uh, for, like the folder template, uh, we need to create a template for a code. We can do that easily running the command func new. Here, I'm going to pick an HTTP trigger, but you can try real easily to use any other uh, trigger as well. And I'm also going to choose the name for my function. 
In my case, that's response text processing. What this will do is generate another folder for my function and inside we will have two files. Now we will look in a bit more detail what these files contain. Um, the function JSON file contains all the necessary endpoint configuration. So this is where we specify which uh, file is the startup um, uh, point, as well as all the incoming HTTP requests and responses, which is in line with the trigger I picked previously. Then we have the init file, and this is our hello world template that was generated for us. Um, that contains our template for serverless functions we can modify later. Uh, so here we have first the library imports. Uh, logging is not mandatory, but it's highly encouraged because you can debug your function in a more easy way. And you have to use the Azure Functions module if you want to create a serverless function. Uh, you can see that this function uses uh, an HTTP request as an input and an HTTP response as an output. What we do is we check whether the HTTP request contain a parameter uh, with the name. And if that's not fine initially, we check whether there is a JSON that was provided <clears throat> and whether this JSON contains a name value. If a name is found, we return an HTTP response, hello plus the name we found. And if that's not found, we return an error. Um, so we, after we understand what the template contains, uh, we can start our function locally and test it. We can do this using this uh, command. And what this will do is generate a local address we can use to see whether everything is working as we expected. We can test it by making a very simple curl request, which contains a name and a value. And what this will return is hello plus the value we provided. Uh, this was very interesting. However, we want to make it useful for our own application and we want to use our own dependencies and our own code. So I'm going to show you now quickly how you can do that. So to use your own dependencies, you need to use a virtual environment and just simply do pip trace and this will store all the requirements in the file that was generated for us. Uh, I'm gonna show you how I created like my own simple natural language processing application and um, how I edited the initial templates uh, with it. So I stored my code in the shared uh, uh, code folder and here I have the script that I created. What I need to do is just import the script I created in the init file and modify the contents of the file uh, template that was generated initially. So instead of looking for uh, a name in the HTTP request and returning uh, the string as an output, I want to check whether um, uh, so a file was provided as an HTTP request and then use the method I created just to like do some basic natural language processing. And instead of returning just a simple string, I'm returning the text that I processed previously. So here you can see how easy it is to just quickly modify the template to adjust it to your own application. So everything I show you so far, it was just running locally. So we need to see how we can deploy the code we created on the cloud. So I will not go into a lot of details in all of these commands. I will share the slides and you can try it on your own and then I can help you out if there are any issues. But basically it's quite simple and there are a few commands you need to do. You need to connect to the cloud. You need to create the resource group you're gonna use. <clears throat> Uh, then you need to create a storage account where all the data that your function generates will be stored. Um, you need to create a function app and finally publish your function to Azure. And after that, all your users will be able to access it via the uh, function name you provided. So this was it. Uh, in like few simple steps, we were able to create a simple Python application and deploy it. Um, I know it was a lot of info, info, but you can try all these commands on your own at home and just ping me if there is anything that's uh, difficult or not understandable. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, this is the link. Like I created, uh, I think this presentation was part of a workshop I created with PyLadies Amsterdam. So here you can find examples of how you can run this on your uh, Windows or Linux machines. And if you have any questions, just reach out. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So um, we were half. Uh, sorry, I I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, no, I mean the next speaker. Um, next speaker. We have, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, like Yaroslav. Yaroslav. Yaroslav, sorry. Yeah, uh, so yeah, it's, it's your turn now. So uh, when you're ready, you can stop sharing your screen. And, oh, sorry. Uh, are you all right, Dana? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, you haven't, I can, I can stop it for you if you want to. Okay. All right. Oh yeah, we are screen. ready, okay. Yeah, we have switched now, so we can see your screen. Cool. Yeah, so let me start. Yeah. Uh, my name is Yaroslav. I'm saying hello from sunny Munich today. 
And today I would like to share uh, the tool which I developed to make the life of other people easier. So how the computer of a normal user, of a typical user looks like, there are a lot of files like docx, xls, jpg JPG file and png, whatever. How the computer of developer looks like, it's a lot of script files, build CV, calc balance Perl and so on. And now comes the question, how we can make our users get benefits of those scripts? For me, I, I tried like sharing the scripts, just give, giving the script to a user and asking, could you execute it please? But then there is different Python environments, some uh, dependencies are not installed. And for some users, it just doesn't make any sense at all. For example, I cannot imagine telling my mom, could you execute a Perl script please? It will not work. So, and I came up with a solution. It was a Python uh, and I created a web server which propagates the code to the scripts to the user. So for the user, it's just a browser application basically. And for administrator, it is a simple way to configure the scripts. So this, this is how I came up with a solution called script server. Uh, and I would say it is fast, it is simple, and it is user oriented. So it's very simple for other people. And it is open source and it is used by other people. And I would like to make a short demo on how it works. You can also, after the presentation, check scriptserver.net for, uh, for other demonstrations, for other scripts. And for now, I will share how you can do it. So I download the release of my tool. It's just a normal release uh, and I would like to extract it. Yeah, and then I need to start it. CD. Yeah, so server is running. We can already go to it and we will see blank page because so far nothing is configured. As an administrator, I can go and add a new script there. Uh, it, basically, the tool is very script agnostic. You can do whatever you want. So for now, I would like to add a pink script. It has just one parameter, which is called host. And it is required. Basically, that's it. Now, if I go to normal interface, I will see this script already. So as a user, I can just go open this page put my parameter here and execute it. It will immediately give me results. Uh, so usually scripts are a little bit more than one parameter, can be two, can be interactive or whatever. Uh, so for example, you can easily add one more parameter, which is count, which is integer from one to 10. Done. Now you can see this parameter here. You can put host, you can put count, not working, let's say six. And it just picks and works. Uh, you can also do some input if you want. If your script requires interactive input from the user, it will work. Uh, basically that's how I created the tool. I had a lot of scripts which were already working for me. They were in Python or in Bash. And they, I didn't want to adjust them. I just wanted to create a web interface around them. So basically by providing simple config or some configuration to your script, you can wrap anything you want. And uh, in the presentation, I gave this example of view kittens. So I created a script for, view, for viewing kittens. I would like to have configuration for it. So I prepared in advance some configuration and now we have download kitten script. The script just basically downloads three second, every 30 seconds new image and displays them to the user. And so script server just displays what script displays. Basically it's a picture of the kittens and yeah. So you can put whatever script you want. You can wrap it with a script server and share it with the users instead of asking them to prepare any environment. Simple one minute, two minutes, your configuration is there. And for users, it's even simpler, just one, two parameters and execute. 
I think that's all for me. Uh, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the Discord. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, okay, yeah, <laughs> I have very, okay. Yeah, so um, thank you so much. And uh, I will stop sharing your screen so uh, the next speaker can be up. Uh, so the next speaker is, um, yeah, um, me, I'm, I'm horrible with names. Uh, Mira, uh, me, Micha, me, Micha, Micha, Micha. Micha. <laughs> yeah. I so uh, I would, I would also created the the channel for you. So if people have questions, can ask you there. And when you're ready, you can um, start. Yes, one second. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you, and I can see your screen perfectly. So. All right. So I will start. So, uh, hello and welcome everyone uh, to my introduction to web scraping and scrapey, with scrapey and pizza. Uh, first of all, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mircha. I am working for Scraping Hub. I am currently also a student and didn't start. Uh, I started working before uh, <laughs> I was a student. So I am to have this talk for everybody, even if you don't have a lot of technical knowledge, you can follow up and later on I will get into some more advanced stuff. Uh, but yeah, I will talk about scraping and scraping in general. So web scraping is about gathering data from the internet. You uh, basically can go to a website and gather, for example, prices for a lot of products by hand, or you can write the Python script to extract the data for you. And scrapy is a framework for doing just that. So. Uh, to get started, all you need to do is install it in your Python environment and you can start a project. Um, here, the name for the project is Python Pizza. This will generate your basic project structure, which uh, I will discuss later on. So uh, the first concept you need to understand is that of a spider. So basically, um, you have one spider to crawl a given website. Uh, you can have a spider crawl multiple websites, but it's usually better to encapsulate the logic for one website in one spider. Um, so a spider uh, sends requests and uh, these have your URL, URL methods, the most common of which are get and post, uh, and you receive back responses that have bodies and status codes. Two, 200 status codes usually mean uh, it was a success. So uh, let's look at how a basic spider class looks like. Uh, this is just a Python class that inherits from the Scrapey Spider class, it has a unique identifier uh, name, which we will use later on to involve the spider. It has a list of URLs called start URLs that Scrapey will use to send get request. In this case, it will send only one get request to this uh, particular website. And it will give us back the response for that request in uh, this method, which is a Scrapey callback. So a callback receives and parses a response to send back uh, more requests or uh, items, uh, either scrapy items or Python dictionaries. So, uh, oh yeah, one other concept that you need to be aware of is uh, that of the selectors. You uh, receive back structured data in the form of HTML, for example, and you can help, you can extract data points uh, from it using selectors such as CSS selectors and expat selectors. Uh, one quick way to describe this is that CSS selectors are usually shorter and cleaner and expat selectors are a bit more verbose and more powerful. Uh, so uh, you might have seen this website uh, has some text over here, a uh, pretty structure uh, here for the schedule. Each speaker has its own uh, uh, box. And if you right click this box and hit inspect, you will see something like this. So. Um, on the right side here, you can see that each of these boxes in, is encapsulated in one div tag and ha that has this class and uh, the, talk, the talk title is in this h2 talk, uh, tag and then you have the uh, name of the speaker in the p tag. So we want to extract this and maybe more information and we can do that in our spider like so. So here I extract a selector list for each of those items in the schedule and for each of those talks, I um, extract the social link, for example, uh, Twitter accounts or personal websites. Uh, this is the most bare bones uh, structure of a spider. Basically, you do some extraction and then you yield your items. Um, you can try to run this, but it will not actually work. There is a problem. Um, 
If you look at this website, what you see is actually the rendered output. So there's a bunch more of stuff, there's a bunch more stuff going on in the background, such as loading JavaScript and loading images and a lot more requests. But in our spider, we have only one request. So how does this uh, site look without website, uh, without JavaScript? Well, it looks like this. Remember, your browser sends uh, dozens of requests for the simplest web pages. And in your spider, you have to send individual requests for all of these. So don't give up on your web scraping career just yet because there are solutions to this. Uh, what you can do is look in the page source and look in, open up the developers tools again and go to the networks tab to inspect the traffic. So if you right click and hit inspect in the networks tab, you will see something like this. So for this particular page, uh, if you can see at the bottom here, uh, it requires 75 requests to load. So the first request is the one that we are actually processing in our spider. Uh, but it doesn't contain the data that we need. But that data must come from somewhere, right? Uh, it is displayed. So after looking through each of these requests, you will find something like this. This is a JavaScript request. And in the JavaScript code here, we can see there is an array of speakers with nicely formatted data. For each speaker, we can see the name, the photo, the job title, the social link, and uh, more. So uh, one thing I want to note here is the structure of this URL. You see it has this strange hash over here. So you cannot fetch it directly because it will change. It might change with your browser session or it might change when you uh, start the scraper tomorrow. So you have to fetch it from the initial page and then uh, go to it. So also one problem that we have is, this, is that this is not structured data. This is uh, JavaScript code. Uh, to parse this JavaScript code, I want to show you uh, that you can use the js to py library uh, to install it in your Python and simply pick install. And uh, we need to modify our spider a bit to use this. A bit more code here, bear with me. So first we extract the js path for that URL, like so. I also wanted to show you here how powerful xpath functions can be. So you can select a script tag that has in the source attributes this JS index text, and then select that source attribute from the script tag. Uh, it will look something like this, and then we can simply tell it, tell Scrapey to follow that path. This is basically a nicer syntax for this. Um, it would return a Scrapey request and format that URL by hand, but uh, Scrapey offers a much nicer way with response that follow. Um, also, please uh, make sure you remember to specify the callbacks. Otherwise, uh, the response for this request will be sent to parse, which is the default callback. So the response for the JS path will be sent to parse.js. Next up, in parse.js, we have to extract the speakers array. So uh, what we can do here is to select the entire body using the CSS selector and the asterisk syntax to extract the entire body. And then using this regex, we can extract um, the entire array. Uh, you could also do this using the regex library directly on the response.body attribute, but I wanted to show you here that you have more attributes on these selector classes. Uh, next, I cleaned the data a little bit because there were some strain, uh, st uh, stray function calls that needed to be removed, and then I evaluate uh, the, uh, this string. Basically, at this point, speakers array is just a list of dictionaries that I can use to extract my uh, data points. So to start our scraper, all we need to do is run scrapey crawl Python pizza. Python pizza is the spider name. And you could also do it like so to export the data to a CSV and other formats are supported as well, just like JSON, for example. In speakers.csv, you have your basic uh, list of URLs. Uh, and at this point, uh, yeah, you're basically, uh, you know, scrapey. <laughs> So I want to show you next a couple of use cases for scraping. For example, uh, you could use scraping to do some price analysis to compare with your uh, competitors. So you could also use it to scrape reviews from the internet to understand how your product is perceived on the market. Um, and you could also use it to uh, decide if it's time to make a Twitter account. So a lot of the speakers here have a Twitter account. Um, and I guess it's time for me to make one as well. So yeah, that was my talk, guys. I hope I gave you a nice introduction to scraping. Uh, let's follow up with the discussion on the Discord channel. And if you have any other questions, uh, ping me there.
Right, thank you so much. And again, I would stop your screen. And uh, next speaker, uh, can you get ready? So um, let me try to pronounce your name. I like we have so like with so many diverse speakers that you know I can tell like by me not able to pronounce the name there like from uh, from everywhere. Um, so um, uh, Mats, ma, uh, Mats, Mats. Matche, 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 yay! So yeah, you got a very interesting talk. So I think you're up next. Are you ready, or are you actually in the um in the panel? No, no, he he's using the he's using this other account uh, for for giving. Maybe we need to the talk because he still has. Yeah. Uh, so if, if like he did some time, okay. then maybe, okay. Are you ready? Cool. Yes. We have yes. you, we can see you. Yes. Okay, perfect. Because I'm uh, having two computers right now set up. One yeah. is for streaming uh, <laughs> and the other one is uh, for video and yeah. uh, talking. So. Cool. Cool. So um, when you're ready, uh, you can start moving. Uh, this should be it. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, so hello everyone. Uh, today I wanted to present to you uh, my project uh, in Python, which is called Tonic. And it is about autonomous uh, robot slash car in Python. So after graduating the university, uh, me and my friend Wojtek uh, wanted to do some big project. Uh, also, this project has nothing to do with my professional work. I am a PhD student uh, in physics um, and do a lot of uh, machine learning stuff. And uh, also this presentation will be like a history of the project because it actually uh, is taking me like three years to develop everything. Um, so at the time we, when we were talking the hype uh, for the autonomous driving cars were was uh, at its peak, um, but uh, all of them are pretty uh, expensive. So normal uh, person cannot really afford uh, any of those cars which has uh, autonomous features um, or semi-autonomous driving. Uh, it's mostly because of uh, LiDAR, uh, which in case of Tesla is not looking like this, but this is uh, what makes uh, everything uh, really expensive. So let's get rid of, of uh, LiDAR, which is uh, laser measurement of the distance. And also this is always marketed as luxury. So autonomous driving seems to be accessible only for the wealthy. Uh, but there is 8 billion of us. Uh, why can't everyone benefit from this technology? Also, I, I don't have much money to afford uh, autonomous car. So that would be nice to have uh, one for a cheap price. Uh, so let's build uh, as uh, cheap as possible autonomous car. Um, of course, I don't have money uh, even to invest in a, uh, to uh, turn normal car into uh, autonomous driving car. So let's start with RC controlled uh, version. So this is the first model version. Uh, it's just Raspberry Pi with a uh, glued on top of the RC ca controlled car and there is a driver uh, by USB port with uh, Arduino uh, controlling the remote. Uh, the second version was uh, much nicer looking and also uh, a lot better. Uh, so what I did there is I put inside Raspberry uh, Pi with battery and a driver that changes Raspberry's HBIO output to signal to the motors and looks like this. So. How, how the software works uh, is quite easy. This is the entire software for video streaming when it comes to uh, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so what you can see here is we take uh, the camera output, we uh, translate it into bytes and we send it over TCP. And on the other uh, side on the laptop, uh, we, have, we are receiving decoding the bytes and trans uh, transforming them into uh, NumPy array, and then using PyQt signal to send it for uh, viewing. So is it slow? 
it isn't slow and I don't really know why. Um, I'm not using multiprocessing, I'm using PyQt signal and it's quite fast. It's uh, actually the quite the fastest software for Raspberry Pi uh, that I could find or library or like anything. Um, yeah, I don't know why, why, it's, why it is so. Uh, when it comes for, uh, to steering, um, I use Raspberry's uh, GPIO, which is quite simple. You just take a, GPI, a GPIO dot output and then uh, say which pin you would like to change output to. And then uh, you add some value, which is directly related to value of the speed of the motor. And then you, of course, send it over Wi-Fi over TCP uh, with sockets. So sometime after reaching Mark II, Wojtek parted from the project, project and later decided to buy a boat and uh, live on it. And now he travels the world uh, around in his boat and has a YouTube channel, so go subscribe. Um, so a lot of time was passing uh, when I was doing this project. And But how about uh, the actual autonomous driving? So I pick up interest in something called SLAM, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. And on the right side, you can see a demo of Orb SLAM 2 library. So uh, how it works, it gets a lot of uh, characteristic points, those uh, green dots from video, uh, which are the uh, pixels that are very, groups of pixels that uh, do not change between uh, video frames. And then it calculates their movement uh, in uh, regards to the frame, uh, in regards to the um, to the camera, and then uh, trans translates uh, those movements into movements of the camera, uh, assuming that the points are stationary. Uh, then you can uh, join those points and uh, other frames uh, that you uh, connect uh, in a hypergraph and do some optimization. So, uh, how to use this for autonomous uh, car? My idea was to get video uh, from uh, the uh, immediate area when, where you want to use your car, uh, create a map using SLAM, adjust the map uh, manually, mark crossings, uh, and now you know exactly where you are, you can move on predefined path. Also, we should use uh, one camera instead of two. But sadly, Orb SLAM 2 was the only open software I could find at the time. Uh, it is C++ only, has no option to save the map, so I decided to experiment with other things, lots of other things, like this flow-based uh, approach to SLAM, which is uh, checking every single pixel there is uh, for change and tries to calculate the movement of the camera. Uh, I implemented accelerometer, gyroscope, odometry, and did a lot, about one year worth of experiments with it. And uh, all all of this uh, is there on my repository. Uh, there are uh, readmes on how to connect hardware and uh, how to make it run. Uh, I also tried to join everything that I had, accelerometer, gyro, uh, flow-based SLAM, uh, to make a 2D map, uh, as seen from the above, which uh, yielded uh, mediocre results. Uh, also, I uh, implemented an entire SLAM, uh, similarly to uh, Geohot, uh, who did that as well, uh, but it did not work as well as uh, Orb Slam 2. Also, I wanted to try uh, Kalman filtering. Uh, notice that book. This book is uh, really good, I, and uh, Kalman filtering would allow me to join everything together, every measurement into a single one. So I was working um, a, lot of, uh, a lot on uh, the Kalman filtering and odometry, and during that time, I moved from doing this project at home to moving this project at, at Hackerspace Krakow. And they uh, helped me a lot. Uh, during that time, I had a lot of problems with uh, random resets of Raspberry. Um, and, they, uh, and I asked them for help, and they told me just to use a condenser uh, plugged in. And it worked. And then uh, I had problems with SLAM they said to try to use wide angle camera. And it worked. Uh, and it worked so well that I went uh, back to working, trying to work with Orb Slam instead of other experimentation. Uh, also, this is the current version of uh, my robot. Uh, I bumped up the version of Pi to A plus. 
uh, changed uh, the chassis. Uh, but uh, how about the slam? Uh, luckily, during my time of experimentation, someone created Orb Slam 2, Python bindings, and someone else created a script on installing the previous repository, but none of them uh, really worked, so I uh, forked those repositories. Also, Alessandro, Alejandro Silvestri created OS map, uh, code that uh, can dump Orb Slam 2 map uh, to a protobuf file. So I uh, forked everything and created a master a kind of repository that uh, installs everything and adds a, a Docker container on top of that. And I created a tonic orange uh, repository that uh, makes everything works. And then I achieved, I achieved Python because now you can do import or slam too and it works. Uh, so where I am now with that, I can take the dat data set of images, create a 3D map representation and save it to file. In almost lifetime, I can check the position and orientation of the car. Uh, I can set images and uh, direct uh, the car into it, but I did not uh, implement string because of the coronavirus. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so uh, more recognition to Lukasz Mitka for helping me with uh, hardware and uh, budding for creating nice pretty 3D printed mount uh, for the camera. And if you'd like to check uh, this project out, you can find it under uh, this uh, link to the repository. If not, there is a recipe for a really nice pizza here as well. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it's a very good talk. And next we will have Adrian uh, of PsycheLearn. So, yeah, yeah, Luckily you know so. my name. Yeah, I, I know you obviously. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's your turn now. And okay. um, yes, yeah, just let me. Also, it looks like we're Fun. almost on time again. Uh, we have one one more talk that we moved. That's uh, true. Yeah, so we oh, still like, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're still like behind, but. Oh, but fine. We just have like pizza while we are like watching the talks afterwards. So <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. And um, when you're ready. Yep. So hello, everybody. I'm Adrian. I, um, I'm one of the Cycleland um, maintainers and I also help with the PyData Berlin, one of the organizers there. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about how we can write a custom Cycleland estimator that is compatible with the everything else there. Um, and for people who are not familiar with it, Scikit-Learn is a machine learning library that implements a lot of statistical models. It doesn't include the deep learning stuff, um, not much GPU at all, uh, but everything else is there, kind of. Uh, before we begin, what are the, we need to understand what are some of the important parts of the API. Uh, we have the estimators, they are either transformers or predictors. Um, the predictors can be classifiers or regressors. You have your scores and you have a bunch of meta estimators, uh, which take one or more other estimators and do something with them. And the most to use, the, the most used two meta estimators are pipeline and grid search. So Sorry, what are, um, could, could you please yes. increase this font size a bit? Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, so what does a usual uh, pipeline look like? Uh, we get our data. Here we would have some text data. We pre-process the text. And then once the, the data is ready, we pass it to a classifier. Let's say we want to predict the topic of the text, for instance. And we put all of that in a pipeline. And now when we have a bunch of these components in a pipeline, each of them usually have um, a few hyperparameters that we would need to find the best of. For example, in the case of our classifier, we need to find different um, penalties, different like penalty terms, regularization, and we, we need to find the one that works best for our data. So we put that, we, we define our uh, parameter space and we do a grid search on that parameter space for the given pipeline. And now grid search itself will behave like yet another estimator. 
So with all of that flexibility, why would we ever need to write a custom estimator? Well, scikit-learn doesn't really include all algorithms out there. Um, in fact, it has a really high bar for including one because uh, it would otherwise be really hard to maintain them all. So if you are a researcher working on a really new cool algorithm, or if you have a use case which is very specific and set an algorithm out there really works for you, then you may want to write your own estimator for that purpose. Now, what does the API look like? Um, the basic API looks like if you have an for the estimator, if you have a, um, uh, the estimator, you will have your fit, which does the training. If it's a predictor, you will have your predict, which gives the final prediction. In case of a classification, for example, it would give you the class, or if you want the smooth uh, values for the probabilities of like belonging to which class you have predict proba or like decision function, which is more of a raw value based on which the predict is um, working. If you're a transformer, you would have your transform, and for the predictors, you would have your score. Now, let's try to write um, our first estimator. What do we have here? Here, I'm going to write an estimator that does some logging in fit and predict. It's just to show how it could work. Uh, and I'm wrapping around a support vector classifier. What else am I using here? Um, I'm using a base estimator. Any estimator needs to inherit from that. And instead, so we use composition in scikit-learn as in you need to use a bunch of mixins um, together to create what you need. And for the case of classifier, I would have my classifier mixin and some utility functions that I will talk about a bit later. Now for my classifier, I would have it from classifier mixin and base estimator and my constructor will take C, which is one of the parameters to the SVC uh, just to demonstrate how it would work. I said that in init, I do no validation. Then I do in my fit, I can check, I can val if I want, I can validate C. Uh, so parameter validations would be done in fit only. And I can check whether or not my X and Y are correct. Um, use one of those utility functions, check X, Y, which checks if they are like not NumPy, it would convert them to NumPy. If they're not of the same length, it would raise an error. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then I will train my support vector classifier with my data, uh, with the given C, and um, I would store that in my estimator here. And then I go down in my predict, I make sure that my um, estimator now is fitted. The fit is called first. I do my validation on X, and then I delegate my prediction to the estimator that I just trained. If I want, I can also expose the decision function of the underlying estimator. Now, what are the uh, validation routines that I used? Check is fitted is a uh, text estimator. The other ones are optional. It basically checks if you have any attribute which ends with an underscore and does not start with an underscore. By convention, we set everything in fit. Everything that we set in we set in fit, it should follow this pattern. Um, check array is a really nice utility that um, you can pass your array like object and it will return your NumPy array. Or if you want to support sparse, it can just keep the sparse array as is. And check XY does a little bit of extra validation to make sure that the X and Y are of the same length, for example. Now that I have my classifier, uh, how do I make sure that it actually follows all the conventions? Well, we, we have a really nice um, routine here um, that you can import and it works really nice with PyTest. And here I'm passing my classifier to it and it runs all the tests. Here you see that I run the tests and it's passing everything. But the first time that I wrote it, it didn't pass. I had to go back and I had forgotten to put down these, these classes underscore. Again, by convention, anything that is a classifier, it has to expose the classes. And if it doesn't, it raises. And then uh, once that is done, then everything is easy as usual. Uh, you can do your training, you get your scoring, you can put that in a pipeline and you can um, do a grid search on your pipeline. And here you see that it is like working really nicely and is find, finding the best parameter for the data that I have. 
some of the extra bits and pieces that you need to care for um, is, as I said, FIT should be the only place that does uh, validation. And the uh, other parameters that it takes, the FIT parameters, by convention, they should be sample aligned. As in, if you want to pass something related to your features, or if you find, if you want to pass something which is a regularization parameter, those should be your constructor, pro constructor parameters. Um, the attributes, if the attributes without underscore are the ones that are passed to the constructor, they're the main parameters. The ones with the uh, underscore at the end are the public ones that are set in fit. And if anything, you want to have private by convention, then you start that with an underscore. And by public and private, the only thing that um, I mean by that is that we try to be, or like, you can also try, to be backward compatible and be really stable on those ones. But if anything starts with an underscore, then you can change from release to release. We also have a, um, a few extra bits that you can um, tune your estimator for the tests. For example, is your, is your estimator stateless? As in, does fit make sense or not? Most of them are not stateless. You need to call fit. Does it support multi label? Etc. Etc. And if you are not following the default, you can add that uh, by this underscore more tags and say my estimator actually does these things. It's not deterministic and it only has multi output. It doesn't like pass a single output. And if you're interested in like knowing what the, some of the developments in terms of the estimator API is, I've um, left here some of the links to them. You can um, follow their nice reads. The slips are uh, the scikit-learn enhancement proposals, and we talk about these features that we're adding um, to the to the estimator. Some of them are already in, and in the future release, which is coming out in probably two weeks, they should be there. And if you want to write your own estimator, I strongly recommend reading this page and uh, finding all the public classes in these three files. They are really useful. And thank you. I will take the questions in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. And I think, yeah, before we have to, uh, you know, we go to the break for pizza, we would have uh, Arthur back up here. Yes, yeah, I can see your your screen, which is, uh, you know, a terminal. Um, yes, can you hear me as well? I can hear you, so uh, ready when you are. Okay, perfect. So without further ado, hi, I'm Arthur. Um, I've heard people thanking the organizer thro organizers throughout the day. As one of the organizers, I'd like to use the opportunity to thank all the participants. I hope you're having a great time, even when the stream doesn't uh, work as expected. Um, also, I would like to use this opportunity to thank the Python Pizza Naples, and I'm sure if we've done this before today, um, the people who came up with the format and registered the domain name and so on. We have Marco and Patrick on the uh, on Discord, so you can thank them over there. And also thank Christian, uh, who brought the pizza to Berlin and um, popular there since everyone seems to have the Berlin story um, this today. Um, I gave a talk in PyPizza Berlin last year, which was called the Connecting the Dots, which was about punctuation in Python. This talk is called Connecting More Dots, although it's not about punctuation, but it's the same sort of genre of the talk. Uh, there are talks that tell you what you should do, and there are talks that tell you what you can do, but you probably shouldn't. And this is definitely the latter. Um, so I'm gonna show you like a couple of things that you may learn something, but probably you don't want that anywhere um, in production. So I'm actually going for a live demo because Ian said that everything's going smoothly today. That was before they kicked us off of YouTube. Um, so let's try this. Um, the sort of basis for the talk is something that I already posted on the, on the puzzles channel. Uh, there are two files. They have some dots in them. And if I run the first one, it prints Hello World. And if I run the second one, it prints Fizzbuzz. And it's gonna be like a high level overview of how this works and what's required to make it work. 
Mm, this is like a 10 minute version of a 40 minute talk. So I cut out a lot of stuff. I'm happy to put more description later on uh, Discord if you want. Okay, so the first uh, element for this are the, is the encoding. This exact um, line. You probably don't use it these days anymore, but it used to be very popular back in the Python 2 days. And uh, the story of how I came up to with this sort of puzzle starts at EuroPython last year, specifically at the sprints. Uh, I met Carl there, and Carl, I think we also have on Discord today, who was working on a project called Dansk. And Dansk is, or Dansk Pi, it's a custom encoding that allows you to run um, Viking in Python. You can actually run this, and it will produce Fibonacci sequence. And the way that works, it defines this custom encoding, which you can see here, and you can see it also on YouTube. And it's actually quite complicated because it runs the whole um, analysis and then as to yeah anyway you can check it out on, on github or talk with carl later on uh, i'm going to show you a, a simpler example of how we can create a custom um, encoding um, so this if i run that it will print hello from encoding and that's because uh, if i go to custom.py you can see just nice 42 line file it registers a custom encoding it creates it passing a bunch of uh, encoders to it and then you have to define them. It's basically doing a copy of the UTF-8 with this additional line. That function is important. It basically takes the input, which is the source of the, code, of the file, and then allows you to run arbitrary Python in this place. Okay, so what can you do with this? Um, let's, for example, take a rather useless case of making something that this case insensitive, and then you can run that, and it will work because the case encoding that is used, it basically pushing everything to lowercase and then pushing that later to Python, which makes the whole thing work. Um, what else can you do? Well, it's this um, arbitrary Python, so you can literally, um, well, just this is just hello world. You can run that hello world and it will open XKCD for you or let you fly uh, however you want to interpret this because of this line. Again, being able to run arbitrary Python. Um, but how can, you, how can you use that? Like, you can run arbitrary Python. Is that like the limit? Um, what if you want to run something? Uh, what if you want to run something else? So let's say you're coming from C++ or C background, and all you ever wanted is to have preprocessor in Python, C-style preprocessor. Uh, well, you could use a custom encoding to write one, but actually writing a preprocessor is kind of complicated. You can just run this code and you can see it, it works. It can define foo, it can include bar, and then that function registers even with F strings in them. Uh, and the reason is because it has a custom encoding that runs GCC in a subprocess. Then you can grab the standard output of that, push it as an input later on, and uh, it will basically work. It will just do the preprocessing of GCC and then you can run it with Python. Okay, so that's like the sort of the funny part. Can you use that productively in any way? And actually you can, because there's, for example, a project called Future F Strings, and shout out to Anthony who's maintaining that project. Uh, you basically define a custom, custom encoding Future F Strings, you pip install that package, and then you can run, uh, you can have, have F Strings in versions of Python that doesn't support F Strings, including Python 2, and that would still work. Okay, so now the second idea, so the first idea is encoding. Uh, actually, let's, let's do one more thing. Uh, now with that in mind, we can have, have defined the same file. We have encoding called dots. And the way that the encoding works, actually let's open it them. It basically just have a mapping from prior characters to some Python characters, so, so, so some ASCII characters, and then actually is a valid Python. Then you can run that Python and it produces the hello world. In this case, you can see that there are some blind error commented because originally it had uh, one Braille character to, into uh, one ASCII character, but you can actually map more than one at once. And as you can see, it works. Okay, we'll come back to the uh, Braille a bit later because it's also like a clue of something else that's happening here. 
But in the meantime, um, let's think about how it, how does it uh, run? Because obviously you can create an encoding, but you need to register it first. And I'm going to show you an example that if you run, this is a brand new virtual env. If you run Python, this is actually running 3.6.9. This is a default Ubuntu installation. Um, but if I install a package called deliver method, um, so it works. And now I run Python. It says payload delivered. And that's because it installed something that will be run every time you run Python. Uh, and it will run even if I try to uninstall it because pip is written in uh, delivery method. Because uh, pip is in Python, it will say run that code. And the way that it works, it creates a PTH file. And that's exactly the same way that the DancePy or the future test strings work. Um, during the installation, it creates a PTH file that basically imports um, a module. I can show you how that works. Deliver method, so you create a setup pi that has this um, file that it creates and the only thing it does is imports this and then imports the delivery method module and the delivery method module just prints something. But again, this is arbitrary Python. You can put anywhere here you want and then it will run every time you run something with Python. Okay, uh, so coming back to the, the previous case. So we have a way of installing that encoding. We have a way of writing that encoding but there's still something not, um, not correct with it because I uh, actually let's go to the, well, let's go to part three. Um, yes. So the hello Pi, it has like the UTF-8 and the encodings, you cannot actually create your own UTF encoding. It is not that, it's not that easy, but you can use a different trick. And I'm going to go back to C++ again for a, for a bit. Uh, in C++, this is a legal variable name. If I compile it, uh, A, B, C, C++, it compiles and it runs and it produces one, two, three, because those are all different variables. In Python, that wouldn't work because the backslash is basically the end of the line, but it works in C++. Now, what kind of character is that? You can, in Python, you can import Unicode data and name it. That's going to be U200B, and it says it's zero with space. What is a zero with space? Well, it's basically a space, but it's very narrow. It's zero width, right? Um, okay, so how you can use that? Well, you can, so this is how the file looks like to you, to the human eyes. The browser is a bit of a clue here that there's something that you can see. And if you open it in an editor, you can see that there is a zero with space in the name of the encoding. And what that means, this, oh, this is actually the name of the encoding. So if I create an encoding called OAT, it will use that encoding, but it will look like it's a UTF-8, right? So I can have the encoding here, and then I can run the Hello Pi, and it works um, brilliantly. Okay, so those are like three main parts of how that works. There's only one thing left, and that thing is that this and this looks the same. This we learned that basically translates prior to Python. How does this one work? Well, it's also using those invisible characters, but using them in a slightly different configuration. If I do the hello.py, you can see there's a 200B in the middle. But if I open Fizzbuzz, there's more of them. There's a lot of them. It's actually those, those braid characters are at the end. And what's before it, it's um, encoded in some way in invisible characters. So actually when you, when you see the Fizzbuzz, the actual program is, he, is here, like before the, the Braille. The Braille is actually ignored. And what it does, uh, well actually what it is, um, let me open that again. This is not written in Python. This is written in a programming language called Whitespace. Now Whitespace is a programming language that uses tabs, spaces, and new line characters. But here, uh, so it's only three characters, but here it's also transpiled to a three invisible characters or a three, uh, well, invisible spaces. So that's why if you just cut the file, you don't see them. If you cut it with A, you would, because that's allow you to see the non-printable characters. But the other thing awesome about Python is that you can just pip install whitespace and then import whitespace and then evil a string with 
white space program in it. And you can put that inside an encoding and essentially that's how it works. So that's all I have for you today. And thanks and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. And that's very interesting. And okay, so um, I think this, this is it for this block and it's time for pizza. Uh, sorry that like we are late because we had some problem with the streaming before. That's why everybody's here in the Zoom. But I think that it will be smooth afterwards. And um, please come back, uh, I think like in- 45 minutes. Five minutes, yes. Yeah. So I've, I hope it's still enough time for you to have some pizza. And um, yeah, I'm going to get mine. So uh, thank you so much and see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hello? Can you guys see me and hear me? Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Hi. You want to test your setup? Can I just do a quick check on my slides? Hang on a second. Let me just start the presentation and see how it goes. Uh, Where are my notes? Okay, here they are. And zoom. How do I share my notes? More options. No, share screen. Here it is. Now, what do I want to share? Uh, this tab? Yeah, I think this one. Let's see. Do you see my slides over there? How are you doing? Yeah, I can see your slides. Great. Great. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah, great. Okay. So at least Zoom didn't change as much. Okay. So I guess we'll be all right. <laughs> uh, that was some trouble today. Um, are you running on the web? web? Is it Sorry, could you repeat? Web? Because, uh, I can see your web browser as well so i'm not sure if you're running on the on the web or it's presentation separate uh, i'm running zoom installed on my mac os and uh, it runs on uh, google google slides because on the top i can see um uh different tabs of the of really? the browser yes okay mm, nice nice just uh, noticing that yeah let me check. But you don't see my, my notes, right? They're not uh, on top of I don't of the... see your notes, but I see the docs, Google call, and the link to the presentation. Or... Let me check if I can maybe remove the presentation from the tab itself. Let's see. Yeah, maybe a separate one. Here you go. So now, yeah, so now I see your notes or some text. And get the notes back. Reset, let me go. You don't see any tabs at all right now, right? How are uh, you doing? I can see uh, the text on the black uh, background, the white text. Yeah. So it's not presentation, it's your notes, I think. I need to change the window that you're sharing with me. No. Let's see. Let me try again. I just stop over here, share it again. Let's see. So I have pocket. Let me try just this window over here. Okay, how about now? How are you doing yeah, over there? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Let me check if I can put it into full screen. I guess not, since I only have one monitor. Uh, let's see, full screen for me. And where are my notes? Crap. <laughs> the notes centered on a tab on their own.
you can see you can see just the presentation. Yeah, I see your notes. No, I see your notes. Yeah, damn it. If you want, we can do it like before. If you want, if you don't mind to share your browsers and a lot of tabs of your browser, it's fine. I mean, just okay. small yeah, detail I don't... that. I don't mind. There are so many tabs that's probably not going to show yeah. up anything classified. And uh, I have maybe Gmail open and yeah. that's it. Nothing beyond that. But that's okay. And I trained the presentation several times. So I guess you know, I've done it before without notes. Mm -hmm. So I'll improvise it if it, something okay. happens. Great. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Have a, have sure. a break.